Uh, Rachel Cross and Olivia Campbell are best friends. They're from Stroud. They're in the early 20s. They both went to Stroud High School. But their strong bond wasn't actually formed in the classroom. In fact, um, they only met four months ago and they've just clicked. Isn't that lovely? The pair became best buds after bonding at a support group for people with eating disorders. And now they're starting a charity to help other people cope with the same problems as they have had. Uh, good morning to you both. Bopping around there. Hello. Lovely Hello. to have you in the studio, thank both you, of you together. You. I can't believe, looking at the lovely dynamic between you, that you've only no- known each other months. You look yeah. like, yeah. like <laughs> friends from back in the you know early childhood. Like when does. was Olivia not here? She hasn't ever not been here, but she has not been here. It's really weird yeah. to think about that. But yeah. Did you know you were going to be best friends the minute you saw each other? Um, I don't, oh, know. I don't know. So I interviewed Olivia formally about the support group initially because I set up the support groups in January um, for people with all sorts of eating disorders and carers and parents of people with eating disorders as well. Um, Olivia sent me an email saying, um, could I help out? Could I, I've had an eating disorder, I'm now recovered. Could I give you, give you a hand with a charity, give you a hand with some stuff? Um, I interviewed her formally because I think it's quite a good thing to do. It's quite a sensitive t- topic, so... Mm-hmm hard stuff to to kind of discern whether it's the right person or not and since then it kind of turned out to be that she was exactly the right person for for the group exactly what we needed another person that's had a similar experience to me um and since then it's just been soul sisters so yeah (laughs) how lovely though is that you know should it always be the case so olivia tell me about your experience then Uh, you know what what was your experience as an eating disorder well for me it was um just over a year ago i started becoming really interested in clean eating this whole trend for everything being you know super clean and good for you and although it kind of it started with the right intentions I started to wipe out all foods no food was clean enough and I was scared of all food and there was nothing left for me to eat and I was exercising two times a day on no food and I became really very very ill very quickly did you realise? When did you realise that you were? I didn't realise for a long time. I thought I believed I was very healthy, and then one day I just I kind of crashed. I think I ran out of energy, and then I realised I think this is more than just dieting. But until that point, I really it never even occurred to me that I could have an actual eating disorder. So you were shocked. Yeah, as presumably anybody else. Who I was. You I mean, it still took a long time for me to even refer to it as an eating disorder. I thought I'd just maybe taken the dieting thing a little too far, but that definitely wasn't the case. And what about you, Rachel? Then tell me about your experience. What happened to so you? I developed an eating disorder when I was thirteen. Um, I got diagnosed. I had no idea. I was totally adamant that I didn't have a problem. Everyone else was trying to get me to go to get a diagnosis, and I was refusing to. My parents actually ended up taking me to a clinic, and I got a straight off diagnosis with anorexia nervosa. Um, I think looking back now, having recovered, I struggled for five years. Um, made a full recovery nearly two years ago now, and. I think looking back, I probably struggled from about age seven with body image issues, anxiety, and all the kind of build-up factors that came to the, to the crunch point. Yeah, when I was, I suddenly took it all to the extreme. Um, I was a perfectionist. I starved myself. I exercised, and it went downhill very quickly. And I was in a very bad place, depressed. And yeah, I spent about a year in hospital, just over a year in hospital in West London. Um, that was an inpatient service, so that took me whole year out of school and so I was delayed with my A-levels, delayed with everything really um, and it was it was a horrendous experience but I had a kind of moment of realisation that I just wasted so much of my teenage years, so much of my childhood and it kind of almost clicked to me in a moment that I can't continue to live like this and that was sort of 18 months ago now and now yeah I'd say I was completely free of it, I mean I've had the most amazing year, I've done another gap year so I haven't gone to uni yet, I'm going in this October and it's just been incredible to be so free of this thing that controlled my childhood, controlled my teenage years. And, yeah, it's it's been quite a journey. So, Well, you both look, look well, you look smiley. Thank do, you. Do you, how much of a, a help is it to have each other then to talk to in the same way that others in the support group have each other to talk to? It, it's, a, it's a huge help. Just to, I think one of the reasons we became such good friends so quickly was because we have a lot of shared history, in a sense, and shared emotion. And I mean, when we're just chatting normally as friends, you know, for having a sleepover, we can really easily transition between normal girly talk and, oh, I've had this problem. I had this problem once. And we can talk so openly about it. And I think that's the most valuable thing that we can give each other. Because it is very secretive, isn't it? I it mean, is. there are lots of, mm, of, of illnesses that aren't. And this is one of those issues that is very much kept 
to yourself for as long as you can mm, keep denial it. Denial is a huge problem. Deception, secrecy, all parts of the illness. It's very, it's very da- dangerous the and scary. You want to keep yeah. it. And that must be the hardest thing is having that open. When you were taken to that clinic, presumably you, you were going... Kicking and screaming. I was going to say, you weren't going willingly. <laughs> Not at all, no. So that must have been a toughie for it you It saved my life, though, family. so I'm very grateful that my family um, took me in the end. But I... It was, well, at the time, I was kicking, screaming. I was completely adamant. This is not not yeah. my problem. You've all got a problem. I don't. And that's the sort of dangerous mindset, really, to to be in. Quite scary to think that I was even thinking like that, sort of being so narrow minded and so absorbed with this illness that was controlling my life and wanting me to die. Really, when I've spoken to others um, who've had the same experience, to a one, I've always noticed they are very, very bright, intelligent, lively girls those are the people that i've spoken mm. to until one they you know i mean I, is there somebody that that typically seems to be vulnerable to this uh, horror do you think or, or there are I, a lot of factors yeah there's a lot of factors that are quite um quite typical for someone who's more susceptible to getting an eating disorder um so that would be perfectionist high achievers very intelligent those kind of those kind of things and it is typical that teenage females are in the higher common the common range of people to get an eating disorder but it can affect anyone um it can affect males that are older it can affect anyone at any age and so whereas there is a kind of a typical more diagnostic factor it is it is very kind of open now and lots of people are developing eating disorders like Olivia did with clean eating and that's kind of a new thing I mean a few years ago it wasn't really around in the media much it was all anorexia and bulimia and now orthorexia and and issues with people wanting to get overly muscly that can become an eating disorder too and over exercise body dysmorphia all these things that are it's very, coming into the light it's really insidious in that it can come in so many different forms I mean you, it's things that you don't even notice like exercising to compensate for something you've eaten yeah. that's still a form of eating disorder if you're exercising because you feel like you need to make up for something that you've done earlier that day and i've heard of that I, i've heard of that you know classically said oh i had a, had a you know thing of rollos so i've that's equates of that many calories so i've got to do that yeah. many. Mm-hmm. you know um, it's such an unhealthy unhealthy way to think of things i mean exercise for me is a celebration of what my body yeah. can do now it's healthy as opposed to a punishment for what I've eaten or what I should have been doing. Mm. So tell me about the charity that you started then. So um, we developed a charity called the Beyond Fear Foundation. That developed actually, I had this vision a few months ago because I've got a tattoo on my back that says Beyond Fear Lies Freedom. And for me and my personal journey, that was such a key motivator. I didn't even realise at the time how true that fr- that phrase was, um, that how much I was afraid of life, afraid of living, afraid of almost achieving things that I could achieve, um, afraid of being myself and afraid of other people and being social, how much that was debilitating me and how it kept me in a cage for so long with my eating disorder. And so that was always the vision. And I set up these support groups in January and it started to go really well. We had lots of different people come along. And the whole model for our support groups is having parents, carers and sufferers all together, all mix of ages, genders. Because I've seen in the past when I've been in hospital, when I've had kind of other support groups that I've been to in my long journey as a child, that people have been separated off. And because of the nature of anorexia and bulimia in particular, they're so competitive that having people all together that are a similar age or all sufferers can be very intense and actually more unhelpful than helpful. Huh. And so the model is to have everyone together. Um, and then Olivia came along and we got on like, like a house on fire. And it was really nice to have someone to help along, kind of set this charity up, because it's always been a vision. And I think on my own, it was such a stressful proposition. I, I was so keen to do it, but I was almost a bit lost having just, just my own power. But now it's a team. It's a team thing. We've got other people on the team too. We've got life coaches. We've got a psychologist friend as well um, and other people that are ex-sufferers. And we've got all sorts of interest. And so it's like a team thing and then we're doing it together and it's it's been amazing. So yeah, it's called the Beyond Fear Foundation. Well, we can find out more about it on Facebook. It's Beyond Fear Foundation. You can find it there or indeed at beyondfear.co.uk.